Okay, so we've got uh, another uh, panel here, which will be chaired by the CEO of uh, Science Technology Australia, Katrina Jackson, while we're just getting them up. Um, Katrina does obviously a lot of work and has d spent a lot of time uh, in the late hours getting this event together. Um, and Katrina will be joined by uh, Emily Banks and also Sugo Energy. So over to you, Katrina. Hello, everyone. It's quite surreal being mic'd just sitting here. Um, can, Jeremy, can I ask you to some, send someone over with some water? Uh, it's an, a real pleasure to have, oh, have such fantastic amplification. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have Emily Banks and Shubo Banerjee with me here today. Um, I'll give you a very quick bio of both of them. I'll then explain why they're here up on the podium with them. I'll then ask them also to make a brief opening statement, then we'll get into discussion and then questions importantly from you. Um, Professor Emily Banks is a public health physician and epidemiologist with an interest and expertise in large-scale cohort studies. This is a very hard word, Emily. Pharmo epidemiology. Have I got that right? No, pharmo... Pharmaco epidemiology. Thank you. Just too long for an introduction. <laughs> Uh, women's Health, Aboriginal Health, Healthy Aid and Healthy Ageing at the ANU. She's been closely involved or responsible for a number of very significant studies, including the 45 and Up study and in the UK, the Million Women study. She works closely with government as chair of two major advisory bodies to the Therapeutic <laughs> Drugs Administration. Um, Professor Banks was awarded the UK Woman of Achievement in Science and Technology in 2000 and a gazillion other things through her, her esteemed and fantastic career. Welcome very much, Emily. Thank you, Katrina. Um, Shubo Banerjee is Deputy Secretary in the Department of Education and Training. He was very recently Deputy Secretary in the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science. And we miss him, I must say, desperately. Although Sue Weston is fantastic. <laughs> Uh, he's worked as a management consultant in the private sector. He's worked for an Indigenous policy think tank. He's a physics PhD at the ANU. And I must say, one thing you learn in this town is everybody wants to claim that Shubo is kind of one of theirs. You go around the ANU and they say, yeah, yeah, Shubo, yep, 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 I supervised him, he's one of mine. Um, and he worked on environmental policy and economic and social history at the University of Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. Certainly no like a brains up here on the podium to my left and to my right. I'm feeling undereducated to say the least. So why are these two here? These two are here because what they do is Shubo has taken a very serious program of scientific study right into the heart of the public service. So he's taking his science into the place where policy gets made. We want to hear from him how he does that, why he does that, how it works, how possibly some of you might consider doing the same or at least trying to understand how he does it so we can understand how to penetrate a little bit there ourselves. Emily is here on the inside out. Emily is on the outside in. I'm not doing the analogy very well, am I? Emily is inside academia exerting considerable influence on policy as it's made by government through very significant interaction with government on a number of very pressing issues. I'm going to stop talking myself and invite them both to make an opening statement, then we'll get into questions. Emily, would you like to start? Okay. Um, I hope you don't mind. Uh, I was just going to go up to the podium. I don't know why I feel more comfortable here. Um, I think it's because I do a lot of lectures. Um, so I was asked to do a brief opening statement. I'd like to start by thanking um, Katrina and the organisers and all of you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Um, it's an area that I think is really, really important. Um, so Bertolt Brecht, in his book on the life of Galileo, said that the purpose of science is not to open the door to infinite wisdom, but to set a limit to infinite error. By this, um, I mean, there's many ways you can interpret that. Uh, but the first thing is to say that if we consider that science is based on innovation, then we have to have innovation that is based on the best possible evidence. But we also have to have very tight monitoring about whether what we've done is an error or not. And the gap between innovation and monitoring encompasses the enormous potential for harm. And if you imagine the medical and other scientific mistakes that, that, that history is littered with, it's often that huge gap between innovation and evaluation and monitoring that is responsible for the greatest harm. And they do say that medicine only became effective when doctors learnt to count. <laughs> and counting is a very complex uh, activity and it's sort of what I have 
uh, dedicated my life to. But the first thing I would say that if we're talking about science and policy, then we need evidence-based innovation and we should not have innovation without evaluation. So I have four main uh, pieces of advice and I, I'm going to do this briefly. Katrina said she would crash tackle me if I went on for too long. Um, and I know she's serious. <laughs> so the four things I'd say is that you need to, first of all, understand who your policy warriors are and what their needs are. The second is it's not about you. The third is work hard. Work hard. And the fourth is to be realistic. So just talking about that, you need to understand who, where in the innovation and evaluation sort of spectrum you are and who the people you are trying to influence are because what you do will vary enormously. So a lot of my work that has had an impact has been in tobacco control. Now, first of all, people do tend to tell you you're an idiot if you're looking at researching the health effects of tobacco because it says it on the packet. That's the main thing people say. It says it on the packet. Why are you looking at it? Um, and I know that Australia has the greatest policy warriors in tobacco in the world. So we are a world leader. It's one of our greatest exports. But I happen to know that our policy warriors were using old swords that had been forged in other places. So the estimates we have of the adverse effects of tobacco were actually old, and they were based on other places. We have our own tobacco epidemic. Um, the second thing is it's not about you. So if you go in with some brand new findings, and often people say to me, I've got some findings, and I, I want to get them out there. And I would say, well, and they say, how should I do it? I say, well, I wouldn't necessarily start from here. You want to start with policy influence form, helping you to formulate what you're looking at. So you want to actually be receptive to what is required at the point when you formulate things. So um, the other thing is that policy, good policy, should be based on the sum total of the worldwide evidence. It shouldn't just be based on the one thing you've found. So if you're going to your policymaker with uh, a piece of research, you, the, you should be able to say, this is my research and this is what the sum total of the worldwide evidence looks like. Now, it is quite often that if we do some sort of narrative review of evidence, it looks like the findings are flip-flopping around, like one finding says this, one finding says that. But what we've learned a lot through medicine is if you perform quantitative meta-analyses, what you see is that findings tend to flip-flop around a central tendency. But if you do a quantitative overview, you actually get a much clearer picture. So the Cochrane Review emblem is actually a meta-analysis of use of steroids for preterm labour to prevent uh, respiratory problems in the neonate. And the reason they use that as their emblem is that a lot of babies would have died because we didn't summarise the evidence. And when we summarised the evidence, we had clearer guidance. So consider where what you do fits in with what is known worldwide. Then work hard to make your findings useful. So when we looked at the effect of uh, smoking on mortality, we found we had a threefold increase in relative risk of dying in the follow-up period in current smokers versus never smokers. Now, if I took that to my policy warrior and I said, I've got a big finding for you, the relative risk is three, it would be like handing my policy warrior kind of an unformed piece of metal instead of a sword. Because although that is really important evidence, it's not what they really need. So we then work to take those findings to say, well, actually, if you look at it over a lifetime, up to two thirds of all smokers in Australia, current smokers in Australia, will die from their habit. And that's a, an advance on previous estimates, the old sword, which was half. So we've gone from tossing a coin to odds on dying. The other thing we can say is you lose 10 years of life expectancy on average, and even people who consider themselves light smokers have a doubling in risk. We also said there are 2.7 million smokers in Australia, 1.8 million of those will die if they don't quit. So we took the raw materials and made it into what we thought was a great sword. Um, and we then worked with lots of different agencies, uh, advocacy and otherwise, to, to get that finding into um, the public domain. And then the fourth thing is to be realistic and patient and also to enjoy the process because you're not the only player in the policy process and you may have absolutely no influence. I've found that influencing policy can range from being effortless, a word or two at a committee meeting that somehow hits the right spot, or it can be absolutely impossible, something you've been passionate about for decades achieves nothing, and then everything in between. So you definitely have to enjoy the process and working with great people because there are fabulous people in policy um, and the partnerships are what makes it um, all the more rewarding. Thank you. Nice, Emily. Nice, Emily. Policy warrior. <laughs> Did I get that right? Is he, yeah. He's one of them? Okay. He's a policy warrior. Shiva Banerjee. Thanks very much, Katrina. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation to speak. Uh, I love Science Meets Parliament. It's an honour to be here. Uh, I really think it's a tremendous event. Uh, let me 
acknowledge briefly the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, I love Science Meets Parliament. I think that there's a buzz and an excitement about bringing science to Parliament House that is absolutely tremendous. It is a great day. It is a great opportunity. I hope you, take the, you make the absolute most of it while you're here. Uh, as Katrina said, uh, I'm a lapse physicist. I, I did a PhD here at the ANU, uh, and then I moved into public policy, and I've made my career in public policy. I made that transition precisely because I thought it was incredibly important to do better in thinking about how to use science to shape public policy. So always pleased to come and talk to Science Meets Parliament, but particularly pleased to be doing this session today because it's actually the whole reason why I switched over from physics. In terms of what I've learnt from that journey uh, and what might be useful to you, both in terms of the sessions today, but also, of course, your uh, meet and greets with the politicians, I think the, the first place I'd start is to make sure that you pay proper respect to the process. I think it's incredibly important that the politicians that you meet are respectful of science, but I think you should start from the basis that they will be. When you're at the dinner tonight, when you're in your meetings tomorrow, I, I, you will overwhelmingly find that the politicians that you meet are interested in science. They want to learn more about what you do. They are excited by science. A lot of their constituents are excited by science, their family, a lot of the kids that are around are excited by science. So, like the, you are pushing on an open door. This is a fantastic initiative, Science Meets Parliament, but it is pushing on an open door. The politicians want to learn more about science. They want to learn more about what you do. In return, I think it's only appropriate that you are respectful to their craft, that you understand what it means to be part of this great democracy, what it means to mediate different views, what it means to come to an overall policy position that is framed by science, that is framed by evidence, but considers all the competing interests and considers how overall the country can move forward. This is an incredibly important thing. And for me, the great opportunity of Science Meets Parliament is to give you an insight into that great uh, engine of dem democracy to understand how decisions are made. So I'd start with respect. Then I think, uh, and Emily went to this in her opening remarks, for me, the fundamental issue that you need to think about when you are looking to shape public policy is what is the question that you are being asked? Now, all too often, all too often the, the predisposition is to talk about what is front of mind for you and not what is front of mind for the policymaker that you are talking to. It's incredibly important to think about what the question is. Sometimes when I give these talks uh, in academia and universities, people actually say to me that uh, part of the divide is that academics spend all of their time thinking about the question and policymakers don't. I actually don't think that's true at all. I think policymakers spend a lot of time thinking about what is the precise question that I'm being asked to uh, make a decision on right now. And if you're if you're talking to a policymaker with that degree of focus and that degree of sharpness, this is what I need to solve now, it's really all but useless to them to say, oh, that's really hard. Uh, oh, I'm not sure about the data. Oh, not really sure where we might go with that. But I've been thinking about this other thing. Well, that, that's really not OK. That, that, that's, that's not what they asked you. They asked you this thing. Now, it's reasonable to have a respectful, proper conversation about the thing they've asked you and really explore that in detail and think, well, actually, as we think about this question, you need to have answered this question as a prior and you need to have stepped back and you need to understand the context. That's all perfectly proper. There's no problem with interrogating that question in detail and understanding what, what people actually mean. But the idea that the question that is at hand is somehow too hard or too indeterminate or too tricky or the data is not clear enough, that's useless. Right? You, you, if you want to have influence in policy, you have to be looking to answer the question that has been set. And you need to be practical and serious about timeframes. One of the things that you will have a sense, even in the few days that you are here, is how fast this place moves. In some ways, uh, people have an idea of government and bureaucracy as being a very slow-moving beast. 
Actually, when you're in Canberra during sitting periods, the overwhelming impression is the speed. Things are moving so fast. Decisions are being made all the time. You have to catch your moment. So when Emily says before that uh, interacting with policy can cover the full span from uh, immediate and easy influence to almost no influence at all, often the determining factor is timing. If you are ready at the right time, if the decision's been considered at that time and you have something compelling to say, you can change the world. Now, I think there's a lot in what it means to be a scientist and engaging in public policy. I'm sure we'll get into this as we get into the discussion. Public policy problems are generally messy, complicated, difficult. There is seldom a unique answer. A lot depends on what you assume. A lot depends on how you frame it. How you think about the evidence really is very much determined by who is looking at it in what way. These are complex questions of the nature of science not just scientific content. And I'd really encourage you to reflect on that as well. If you're gonna have influence, you need to think about what you know, why you know it, why you're confident about it, what it means, and where it takes you. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Um, you've both gone to why you do what you do, but I want to ask you both about the moment of choice. For you, Shubo first, what makes a person, did it happen before the Rhodes Scholarship? What, when was the point in which you thought, okay, no, I'm not going to do physics, I'm going to pursue a career in the public service? Because it doesn't happen all that often. So a as a postgrad student, I'd been uh, getting more and more interested in public policy uh, in various ways. And uh, in particular by climate change, which was uh, an issue that was so clearly framed by the science. And I was interested that uh, at that point, the, the science, uh, it was difficult to get a, a proper discussion of the science more broadly in the public policy uh, arena. And so I was interested that ver relatively few people got into public policy making from a science background, particularly from a physics background. Mm -hmm. And so that really pushed me along, along with a kind of long-standing interest in policy and politics. Can you give me an idea of how many people there might be among your public service colleagues who do have science qualifications? It'd be, you'd be counting on one hand in the senior ranks, wouldn't you? Yeah, relatively few. Uh, there, are, there are some people that have uh, done undergraduate degrees in science, and that absolutely gives you a science frame and a way of looking at the world, and that's great. Uh, and then there are relatively few people who have done post-grade qualifications, which I think probably takes you more into a sense of how you frame research questions and how you think about the world in, in that kind of way. I want to talk to you about how you take your science into your job in a minute, but I want to ask Emily about the point of decision as well. Listening to the way you talk about what you do, it doesn't really sound like you had much choice. You want to make things change, don't you? Yeah, um, so I, I first did a medical degree um, and it was actually quite a departure to go into epidemiology and public health. In fact, I had a psychiatrist trying to talk me out of it. Um, I said I hadn't realised it was in the DSM-4, a medical graduate wanting to be an epidemiologist. Um, but what I found was actually, while I was doing my medical degree, it's a very technical degree. It's often, and particularly at that time, it was like, if someone's got this, give them that. If someone's got this, then give them that. And I found it hard to visualise the evidence that underpinned that. And I used to spend a lot of time asking questions. I remember like it was about March or April one year, and I asked a question. The entire back row stood up, started clapping, gave me a certificate, said, congratulations, that's your hundredth question so far this year. <laughs> Here's your question, Ray. So I think the first thing is actually a spirit of inquiry, but also wanting to have the evidence that underpin the action. And then the other thing is that being a public health physician, it isn't enough it, to define uh, the answer to a question. It includes action. So, so that was what really put me in that direction. And the other thing was working clinically in hospitals. Um, it sounds very trite, but really, for a lot of people, it's really too late by the time they get to hospital. Uh, a lot of the diseases are very preventable. And so I really felt that I wanted to work upstream of that, looking not only into the causes of disease, but the action that you could take to make a difference. So for both of you, what you've done is relatively unusual. Is it universally accepted inside your own cultures? Because I want to talk a little bit about culture, I suppose you, Emily. I mean, academics are wonderful, intelligent beasts. But I, mean, I remember Gareth Evans saying one day, if you are doing, spending too much time doing media or you know, doing committees with government, maybe you're not working hard enough on your career. 
he's going to hear me saying that and yeah. come to the room in a minute. <laughs> Don't I, tell. I think there is an issue, um, and I know that one year I organised the pub, I was the, on the scientific committee of the Public Health of Australia Congress, and I organised a kind of debate about crossing over from sort of a pure research angle to more of an advocacy or influence angle. And I think that it, it is a fine line. It is a fine line because you need to maintain a sense of being responsive to the evidence. You don't want to get yourself completely tied to one point of view. So if so, there are some people who've made their name in a particular this causes that kind of thing. Um, you know, Wi-Fi causes cancer or whatever thing like that. <laughs> um, and, and who then go and advocate for that. But basically, you want to be able, you've got to respond to the current evidence. And so if the evidence emerges, I think it was Darwin who said, I try to abandon any hypothesis, however beloved, in the face of evidence to the contrary. So you have to become, I think as um, importantly, you have to become a trusted source that you will be responding to the evidence and that you will be someone who helps to be a window to that evidence rather than someone who is advocating a particular point of view. Okay, and part of your value to the policy making process and to government is that you are a trusted source that doesn't shout from the top of the, um, the parapet about one particular view being better than another particular view, yeah? Well, I, I, that's what I like to think. I mean, I think, you know, we do, we have to accept that there's no specific thing such as objectivity that we're consciously partial. But I do think that Super's point about um, the policy process is important. The policy process model that I think is probably the most uh, true to life is the Kingdom model. I don't know if you're aware of that, but it, it's this idea that there's a political stream, there's a public stream, and then there's a policy stream, and they're kind of different streams that are going on in, in this sort of uh, political stream. There are changes of government, there are little windows that open up, there's kind of pressure brought to bear. In the public stream, there's an idea of issues coming to the fore for the community. And the policy stream, there are, um, there's a process of understanding and development that's going on. And then sometimes they all converge around what you'd call a policy window, which opens up. And at that point, evidence is required within 48 hours, 24 hours, two weeks, or whatever. There's often very narrow, but it comes about because there's a review, because there's actually a political impetus. And one of the things for scientists is how to engage with that, because it's difficult for us to come up with something reliable in the short time frames. So I would argue that if you can engage meaningfully with the policy process over a period of time, you enter the policy stream and you become a trusted source of evidence, but also you're developing things that are in parallel with the needs of policymakers. So when the window opens up, it's easier for the policymaker because they go, oh yes, that that systematic review and meta-analysis has already been done and we already know about that thing. Or we do have a group we can call upon who has expertise in the side effects of this drug or whatever it is. So, because there's no point in waiting to be asked, but also the windows are so narrow, they, they often don't fit in very well with the scientific timetables. So it's actually about developing relationships and partnerships, I think. Okay, so... I, I, I think windows are a really good way of thinking about it and I, I think this idea of being engaged uh, has so many different benefits. Uh, firstly, it increases uh, a, an understanding and literacy in the policy process itself. So you, you kind of know what's likely to be required, how it might work, how the mechanics of it will actually go. And so I think there's enormous value in that. I, I mentioned before different time periods, it's something that I've used in other talks. Uh, we, we talk about there, there are times when you're asked for your view in three hours. And three hours is essentially what you have on your desk now. Uh, written in a, in a legible form that is understandable, it, generally for Parliament that day. So, so there are genuinely three hour requests. Then, then you get three week type requests. And three weeks, or let, let's say three weeks to three months, are, are more or less what is known now. So talk to some serious people about what they think now and put it together in a form that then can be digested and make some assessments or judgments. Let's say if you've got more like three months, you can test that a bit, have some conversations about it, but it is, it is pretty much what's known now. And then you've got three years. And, and the three year horizon is perhaps if a new data set is required or a particular type of methodology needs to be developed or a different type of technique. And it's actually really important to be clear about those different time horizons, what's being asked and what is possible. 
Now, when you're talking to a minister, when you're talking to a politician, three years is almost never going to be a satisfactory answer in the first instance. Now, you, you might you might say, so, so it's something to pull out if you're really thinking, really on a three-week basis, I cannot possibly give you an answer. You need to kick some stuff off that will then be useful when you're asked that question later on down the track, which is part of what Emily was saying. Get the work going so that when the day comes, you're ready for the question to come. Much more likely is the three-week to three-month type time window where you're being asked to look at, on the basis of the current evidence, what is a reasonable view? How can I express that clearly and cogently? And what, on the balance of evidence, can I say? What is my judgment? That, that's a far more likely occurrence. But as I say, you should be clear that often when you're talking to a public servant in particular, even having carved out three weeks to three months is a lot further than the general time cycle, which is three hours. So three hours is exactly what I know now written in a form that is suitable for a minister to answer a question in Parliament this afternoon. Question time's at 2 o'clock. Go. That, that kind of imperative is, is an absolute daily imperative for us. And then you kind of think about, well, there are some questions that you actually want to think about. Ministers absolutely want advice that is more considered than that, that goes up the ladder from there. So if say for argument's sake, someone in the audience has just done a fantastic piece of research on the interaction between a particular kind of soil and a particular kind of chemical, they've got an ARC grant, they've got a result, do they run off to their local politician to tell them all about it that, that second and expect that it will be translated into a major policy change within three weeks, Shubo? Well presumably it'll, it'll depend a little bit on what the policy implications are, so it, it depends a little bit on detail, detail. Where, where, where you're trying to take <laughs> it uh, and what you're trying to do with it. Uh, I, I'd go back to where Emily was taking us, I think, which is you need to be ready. The, 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 it, it's a complex, messy, difficult system. Politics is politics. You, you honestly never know when your opportunity is going to come up. Uh, this is absolutely something that I say to public servants is you need to do detailed, rigorous, careful work as part of your work for the day where it's useful. And you can't, you can't absolutely predict which, when that day is going to come, but when it comes, things move very, very quickly. And when that window is open, you get the chance to make, or well, to provide advice on very big things in a really short period of time that can have enormous consequences. And I suppose you need to think clearly about the fact that your cycle doesn't match the political cycle or the bureaucratic cycle. So it may well be expertise you have from 30 years ago that parliamentarians need advice on or the public service needs advice on, not your new you butte this minute thing. So it's a question of keeping the bottom drawer full all the time. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And, and also, I, I think there's, there's very much the question of judgment. You know, when you have conversations with academics and, and they say, well, on that particular issue, I'm not the expert, that's, that's often true. But clearly, they're much more expert than I am. So, you know, the, the, the kind of <laughs> relative <enough>. standing <laughs> is actually pretty clear. So, you know, if, if we're talking about teacher quality and someone's actually spent their time thinking about class sizes or something like that, they still know much more about teacher quality than I do. Yeah. It, it's still kind of of interest to me to talk to them and figure out where, what they know, what they think, and who I might talk to. It, it might well be a second set of referrals. But the, the idea that, uh, I guess, this criticism of science uh, modern day science is being hyper specialised. One of the consequences of that is that too often I have conversations where people say, oh, well, I'm not expert in this or that, even though to, to me as a generalist, they look pretty adjacent. Okay, so Emily, is, is this something that is ringing a, a familiar bell with you? I mean, academics can often say, no, I can't tell you about that, although you know they know so much about it because they have respect for their colleague who's perhaps published more recently than they have on that thing, and is, is that a constraint to getting into the, the policy process? Mm. 
I think that this speaks a lot to your vantage point as well. When you look up research translation on Wikipedia, it says the process of getting findings from basic science into clinical medicine, actually. And that, to me, is totally stupid. That's not what research translation is, because first of all, science isn't linear, nor is the process of, of getting evidence into policy linear. But also, you can have something from public health that goes into clinical medicine. You can have something from clinical medicine that informs molecular biology. It's, it's, it's a completely dynamic system. Uh, so I think that you have to look very carefully at your vantage point. So if your vantage point, so, so to me, the idea that research translation is taking something from basic science into clinical medicine or something like that is very driven from the point of view of the researcher. It's thinking, I've got findings, I want them to get out there. But in fact, the policy need is, is not that. And quite often, policy makers are not just, first of all, they're saying, well, there's all this research going on, but none of them is actually specifically informing the problem I've got in front of me right now. Um, and so if a policymaker asks you a question and you say, well, that's not my area, it's a symptom of the problems with the system, I think. So I would argue that um, individual researchers can influence policy in a variety of ways, and that can include being on a committee or talking to particular people. I also think specific findings can influence policy if they're sort of big enough. So, for example, the development of a human papillomavirus vaccine is a big finding that's influenced policy, but it's not sufficient into itself. If Ian Fraser goes in, I've got a vaccine, they'll go, well, what's its cost effectiveness? How long does it last? How do we deliver it? There's a huge array of things. So individual findings can influence policy. But the things that really get science into policy effectively are systems that bring it in, that make it mandatory that evidence is included in a, in, in a way. So the biggest example we use there is in drug safety or uh, registration of drugs. You cannot register a drug unless you've really looked at the evidence about its efficacy and its safety. And that's a system. And the level of systematization of getting evidence into policy varies enormously across the whole spectrum of government. In some places it's mandatory, in other places it's done quite well, in other places it's, it's more of an optional extra. And it also depends, I think, on the nature of science. So in places where we do have very good sort of meta-analyses of the large-scale data, it makes it much easier to put that into policy. And if, if you have things that are more narrative-based where it looks like you don't really know what the true state of the evidence is, that makes it harder as well. But anyway, getting back to the point about whether or not you're an expert, mm -hmm. I think it's about putting yourself in and considering the policymaker's needs, not your own needs. Um, and I do think there is a place for saying, well, I'm not an expert in the area, I can direct you to colleagues who are, but my considered opinion, having worked in the area for the last 20 years, is that a good approach is to consider X, Y, and Z, and I think you'd want the latest evidence on A, B, and C. So we'll go to audience questions just after one from me. So ready yourselves, leap towards the microphones, microphones at the ready. I just want to ask you both very briefly, you're both so imbued in that the interconnections between science and policy that it may be hard for you to disentangle yourselves from that and try and step back to being someone who's never done it before. But there will be a number of people in this room who've had no interaction with public policy at any level. If you're there, it's big, it's complex, it's exciting, but it is big and complex. And what I don't want to do is fill people's heads with, it's just too hard. If you've never done it, where do you start? Well, they do say that you can be a genius at chess uh, at a very young age, but to play bridge really well, you've got to be quite old. And I think actually <laughs> that one thing about getting science into policy is it actually takes time to understand and to build the relationships. Um, so I don't think you should be expecting, I think you should be expecting in the first instance to learn and to seek first to understand. Um, and that's not to say you can't have stellar achievements at a young, young age, but I think that, and it will vary by discipline as well, but I think that it is something that takes time to build up and, and to understand. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I, would, I would spend, I mean, this is, Science Meets Parliament, a fantastic opportunity to actually start by, um, you know, learning about the policy process and maybe even learn about your policy warriors. So you've got to be an old fart, Chubo. No, you don't have, not that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, I, 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 nothing beats engagement, right? So if you're interested, uh, get out and start talking to people. You, you're here for a start, so you, you were interested enough to put your name forward. You went through the ferociously competitive process <laughs> to, to get here in the first place. That's fantastic. 
uh, nothing beats learning about stuff, right? Get out there and learn about what it is that you actually want to influence, learn about how your science might have a broader impact. Uh, from, from starters, I guess, a broader degree of science literacy and interest in the broader community, in the broader political debate is a good thing, uh, even if you're not talking about particularly uh, momentous policy changes, the idea that there is a broader conversation about science is a great thing. So that's, that's something that absolutely lies with each and every one of you in terms of your own individual science and what you do and how you talk about it. Uh, talking about the, the, the value of curiosity, talking about uh, what a fantastic thing it is to try and search out new knowledge. Th these are great things to do and they're great things to do on the basis of the science that you're currently doing. Then from that, uh, learn a bit about the process. I, I started with respect the process. The, the great engine of democracy, particularly in Canberra, is a, is a complex and difficult thing, but it's something that you've got to learn about. It, it's not something that's just laid out for you, I think. And the people that are interested in public policy from whatever their domains are, whether it's economics or social policy, or other things have to spend a bit of time learning about it and be engaged and interested enough to actually learn about it, not see it as somehow the other or somehow a, a difficulty or an obstacle. Uh, and I think with that, uh, it repays a bit of study. So I, uh, I, I, I'd absolutely encourage getting involved in different ways, getting engaged in different ways, and it flows naturally from that. Okay, questions? We have one over here in the pinky orange. If you could stand, that would be terrific, just so we can see you. You mentioned that there's relatively few scientists in policy roles, and there's certainly very few among our elected representatives. I'm wondering if, A, you think having more scientists in those kind of roles would actually make a difference to the policy that's formed, and if that's the case, how can these people be attracted into these roles? Uh, yeah, I, know, I, I would be completely and unashamedly talking my book by saying I think it's a good thing to have people with a science background in public policy roles. A hundred uh, shubos in the public uh, service. I, I, I can see some old uh, friends and colleagues in the audience who can give you some slightly unvarnished views about what it's like to work with uh, lapsed physicists in these sorts of roles. But I, I, think, uh, I think it's a good thing. I think a scientific worldview, a scientific way of framing issues is an incredibly valuable thing. I think it's an important thing for our broader society and community. Science is an important part of the world in which we live and the, the way in which we experience it. So to me, that's enough justification to think that it would be good to have uh, people from a science background in various senior policy roles. I, I think beyond that, it, it leads also to a particular rigour that's very, very helpful. And, and I've certainly found that very useful throughout my career. In terms of how you attract more people, I think uh, for starters, it's got to be an attractive career option. I, I've enjoyed every day of being a public servant. I love public policy. It's an incredibly interesting, fantastic vocation. Uh, it, it's something that I talk about a lot. Uh, and it's uh, even though I absolutely adored physics, I, I really, really enjoyed my time doing physics. Uh, as as a professional doing public policy, it's been an incredibly fulfilling path. So I think uh, to be more tangible, I think particularly at the PhD level, I guess it's interesting to think about how you can apply your skills in different ways. And I think a lot of the the training broadly labelled that comes with a PhD is incredibly helpful in a range of different paths. That includes public policy. So Emily, if we have more scientists, politicians, more scientists, bureaucrats, would that solve all the problems of the world? Well, I wouldn't go that far. Um, it's certainly something that I've noticed is that um, it's very useful to have people within public policy who understand how to frame questions that can be answered by data. So quite often when I have an audience of people in policy and I say, well, what are your big imperatives at the moment? What kinds of things are driving your agenda? 
often the questions are not framed in ways that can be tested using data. So I think that one of the things that can really help to bring science and policy closer together is if the scientists are more conversant with policy, but if the policy makers are more conversant with science, and there's nothing like having an interchange, an exchange there. So I actually think policy makers coming and to, to science organisations and doing placements, um, exchanges, and we have actually the princi previous principal medical advisor, Rosemary Knight, is now a visiting fellow with our group, and it's been fantastic. To to have someone who understands the policy process that well to help us to frame where we're going next. Infiltration on all levels. More questions? Over here. Stand, please. Thank you. Hi, Michael. Michael Sally from ANSO, uh, previous speaker. Uh, my question relates to how, do, how does our national policy po process compare to other countries? How effective is it compared to the United States or Canada? We're perfect, aren't we? We're perfect. One of you has and to answer this, I, not I, I me. Will, I will. <laughs> Go, Emily. I, one of the things that has really struck me about, I suppose, about policy, but also about um, improvements generally, is they're incredibly granular. If you imagine uh, the whole sort of health system, we, we're at a certain point. At, say, for example, cardiovascular disease. That's one area I know a lot about. Uh, we we've had an 80% drop in cardiovascular disease death rates since 1968. We currently have around 45,000 deaths a year from cardiovascular disease. We would have 200,000 deaths a year if we hadn't had that huge drop. It's a massive and poorly understood triumph. But the things that have contributed to it have been very, very granular. They've been individuals giving up smoking, there've been changes in all the legislation that make us do that, individuals thinking about their blood pressure, taking their pills, statins, better treatment of people with heart disease, rehabilitation, it, but all of those things have required individual efforts across the community, individual efforts within policy, individual efforts within medicine. Um, and I think that it's very hard, I, I know it's not an answer to the question, but I think it's very hard to generalise across the entire public policy process about who's doing it better in the US or who's doing it better in the UK because it is incredibly granular and it is incredibly large. So Australia is absolutely at the forefront of tobacco control. It's probably not at the forefront in other places. I'd imagine, you know, Finland's doing better at prevention of obesity and uh, other places are probably doing better in other ways. So I think it's probably impossible to put it all together and say who's doing better. Is there, are there one or two things we could learn from overseas examples? Yeah, I, I think just connecting it to the question before that, uh, picking up some good practice from the, the UK and the US, I think some of the institutional structures around getting science into policy are interesting in both places without without claiming to know the full extent of the two systems. Uh, in the UK, I think there's a, well, there is a network of chief scientists for the government departments that operates in a really interesting way. We, we had a visit from uh, some chief, uh, one of the chief scientists from a department actually in nuclear. So he spent some time doing some lecturing with you guys, I soon remember, uh, which was really, really interesting because we, we talked about what are the mechanisms where naturally as part of the process you're getting scientific input and the role of the chief scientist in that kind of form is really interesting and to see what that looks like at a departmental level and then to connect it up there was a network of chief scientists and that was that was for me really interesting from the uk in the us you see some really interesting in institutional stuff about people coming in and out it looks more permeable so that the, there is more of the sense of uh, people with a uh, a straight scientific career doing stints in policy and then coming back out for periods of time. That's interesting as well. And so I think there's obviously a lot for us to learn from different institutional practice in different places without, uh, without suggesting one system is kind of overwhelmingly or unequivocally better. I'll take one more question. And one more question is over here. Oh, thanks. Um, you talk a lot about policy makers. Uh, and my, my question is uh, a leading one. Um, where are the policy makers? Where in science meets parliament? But I don't think it's the policy makers who are in parliament. And uh, both Brian Schmidt and, and you, Emily, spoke about different layers and the importance of alignment between the political layer and uh, the public opi opinion layer. And then I'm guessing the policy makers are in the bureaucratic layer in the middle. So um, maybe Katrina should answer this and whether there should be another uh, event called uh, science meets the bureaucracy. But, <laughs> but my sense is that the, the policy makers are in not science meets parliament, they're in science meets something else. 
there is a science-based policy makers, Peter. <laughs> Indeed, but that's a very boring answer for you. Um, Shubo, do you want to add something? Well, Katrina and I were talking in the setup for science meets policymakers about uh, what we mean by policymakers, and I think it's it's useful to to think about that and interesting to think about that. Uh, I'm a very strict Westminsterist, so so I, I think part of what we're talking about in paying respect to the process, uh, we should be clear that ministers make decisions in our system, and as they should, right? So they they receive advice, they receive advice from public servants, they receive advice from a range of different places. But uh, having received advice and having weighed different considerations, it's for ministers to make decisions. So, so I do think that in a, in a political science type answer, nothing beats influencing ministers, nothing beats influencing parliamentarians. And I think we, uh, in, this, in that sense, science means parliament is pitched in exactly the same, in the right place. A absolutely, we are talking about talking to parliamentarians as the foundation of decision making in a Westminster system. Now, advice from the public service is important, you know, that there's no doubt. Uh, that's part of why I enjoy doing my job. It gives you a chance to think about really interesting issues, think about what the possible paths forward are and provide advice on that. That, that matters a lot. It, does that constitute policy making? Does it you know, they, these are fine distinctions of kind of Westminster type terminology. Uh, interestingly, in the ch climate change space, policymakers is a particular word that's used a lot uh, in the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. They have what's called summary for policymakers, which are the top level documents. And in that sense, I think they actually mean it as some sort of hybrid of politicians and advisors or public servants. Uh, so it's a really, really interesting question. I'd, I'd, I'd go back to the kind of traditional answer is a good one in that ministers are decision makers and you should be clear about that. But of course you should be in a broader conversation in the way that Emily was talking about. Do you want to yeah, agree, absolutely. And I, I also think that often when we're talking about science influencing policy, ultimately what we're talking about is make a, making a difference out there. Um, and so policy makers in the strict sense of bureaucrats are one player. But when I think about, for example, influencing tobacco control, then I'm talking about not, not just, I'm talking about the politicians, I'm talking about the people working specifically in tobacco control. I'm also talking about NGOs like the Heart Foundation, Cancer Council. So it's also about understanding who the warriors are in your particular area and what what kinds of sort of working with them or infiltration will bring the greatest uh, pressure to bear to make a difference. So, so I think the question about where policy is, I mean, it sort of begs the question about where policy is and where is practice developed. And in a sense, it's, it's, it's everywhere. You know, it, it, it is, it's throughout the system. Yeah, and I, I guess I should disavow any potential uh, status or label as a policy warrior. Like, I really don't think of myself in that way, I, I provide advice, and I think there's an honourable profession in providing advice, but it, it's for ministers to take decisions and it's for ministers to take forward convictions and policy directions. I think that's a really nice spot for us to finish. Um, one thing you will hear me and others go on and on and on about in the next couple of days is that we're not asking you to go into a parliamentarian and say, here's a solution. What we're asking you is just to think more fruitfully about what contribution your science might make as a contribution to the policy process as one of the many factors that go in to build the policies that govern every aspect of our, of our daily lives. Uh, I'm not sure we could have had two better speakers than these two on these particular issues. Obviously, we can go on for, well, a whole day. Science-based policymakers, later. Um, thank you very much, Emily Banks and Shiva Banerjee.